it feel good to be back? Yeah. Oh, my goodness, how we've missed you. And good morning to our Facebook friends this morning. We're so excited that you've joined in with us as well today. So if you want to just turn to the person beside you, I'm assuming you're sitting beside them because you've probably been quarantining together and feeling comfortable. So just look at them and say, my goodness, you look so good today. <laughs> And I'll bet their hair looks better today because I'm thinking, did the beauty salons open yet here? Not yet. Oh, I'm really sorry about that. But where I'm, where I'm at, we just opened last Friday. So everybody's looking. They've got their natural hair color back and everything. It's, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> right. So, oh, well, happy Father's Day, everybody. Yes. How many fathers do we have here? Very good. And how many people of you have fathers? You all should raise your hands, right? <laughs> so no one is excluded on these special days, right? You either have children or you have a father. So happy Father's Day. And as I was reading this morning in 1 Corinthians, I was um, reading about uh, the kingdom of God, inheriting the kingdom of God, and what that means. And, you know, I am so grateful to know the father of all fathers. I am so grateful to be in the family of God, to be grafted into um, to the family and to have accepted Christ because Christ is the conduit into that rightful relationship with God that when we say yes to Jesus, we have new life. Amen? We're made new and created new. And what happens whenever we become far, part of a family is there's that inheritance, right? And it requires death to receive what, has, what is to be inherited and to make that will active. And because of the death of Christ, his death has activated the, the contents of the will that God had for each and every one of us, which is the kingdom of God. So we are all, um, we all receive what it is that God has given us, has had for us all along, and now it becomes ours because he is willing us the kingdom and the righteousness of God and how he sees us complete and full now as his kids, you know, his beautiful kids. How many, you know, we have kids, and, and or if you don't have kids, I'm sure that you have people in your life that feel like your children, you know. When you look at them, don't you just see the potential in them, and you see all the things in them that you know they can be. Well, God knows what is in each and every one of us because he's our father, and just to have that kind of relationship and that love, Wow, the power and uh, the change that that brings in all of us. It should be phenomenal, you know. So I just want to think about that this morning as we worship. Thank you, Jesus, for enabling us to receive what it is that God the Father has willed to us from the very beginning, that he has been faithful to us. He's been waiting for us. He's been pursuing us. And just longing for us to turn to him so he can give us all that he has for us this morning. And he can make us new and change us to become more and more like him. So we look like him, right? How many times do people say to you, wow, you look like your dad? <laughs> you know, I want to look like my dad. I want to look more and more every day like my father in heaven. And I'm sure you do too. So let's sing about that this morning, okay? So stand to your feet and worship with me. Father God, we come into your presence and we just glorify you and praise you. This is an exciting day, an exciting moment when we can all come back together again and worship and sing your praises, God, and fellowship together and love on each other, even if it's from a distance, God, just to feel presence of your spirit in each and every person here today is such a gift, God. So I thank you for it. And I just ask that these times of worship, that this would be sweet and precious, God, not just to us, but to you, Father God. And we thank you for this time together. Thank you for making us new 
to become more and more like you so we can look like our dad. We praise you and give you glory in Jesus' name. Everybody in the house said, say it louder. Amen. Amen. Oh, how I've waited to hear your voices. So sing out loud, too, and clap your hands. I could use a rhythm section, okay? <laughs> Doing it alone for three months has been a little rough. <laughs> Here we go. You're calling me over. You're pulling me close. With love you surround me. You're giving me hope. Yeah, yeah. Taking me deeper, you're making me whole. Your grace, you redeem me, yeah. You restore my soul. Now I'm made new because of you. Aren't you grateful for that this morning? Woo! You sound so good. So good. So let's keep singing to this good, good Father that we have. Amen? Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night you tell me that you're pleased and that i'm never alone because you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who for answers far and wide. 
Just tell him how good he is right now. Say it in your own words. Father God, you are so good. You are amazing. You are so worthy. We praise you and give you glory. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for that your promises are yes and amen. you have pursued us even when we turned a blind eye, when we didn't realize, when we didn't know. In our ignorance, God, you still loved us. Pursuing us, God, wanting nothing more than right relationship with us. Intimate relationship, Father. A nurturing relationship, God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. We praise you, God. We praise you.
of the goodness of God. I love your voice. Oh, you have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You were closer like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. Oh, sing it out. Come on. Oh, my life, you have been faithful. Yes, he has. Oh, my life, you have been so, so good. sing of the goodness of God. Come on, His goodness is running after you. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With all my life laid down, it's running after me. Your goodness running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me cause all my life you have been faithful cause all so, so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God. Come on, His goodness is running after you. Sing it again. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Come on, sing it out. Your goodness is running after. It's running after I've surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Oh, thank you, Lord. Because all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have so, so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God Hallelujah goodness. Oh, we sing of your kindness. Oh, we sing of your holiness. Oh, the goodness of the glory, Lord. Oh, your blessing. Oh, your faithfulness is so good. Jesus. 
That's it. Just say his name, Jesus. Jesus, we praise your holy name. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God, I thank you for I thank you for this kingdom inheritance that you have passed along to me, God, and not just for me to keep for myself or for anyone in this place or for anyone that knows you. God, what you give us, what you pass down to us, what you release to us, God, whenever we say yes and are included and grafted into your family, God, those things aren't for us to keep. Those things aren't for us to hoard. God, they are not like earthly treasures that will pass away, that, that, rot, that rust will rot and moths will eat, God. The things that you give us are eternal, eternal and powerful and life-changing, and they're not for us to keep, God, but for, they're for us to pass down to the next generation and the next generation. And God, we thank you for it. We thank you not only what you've done in our lives, God, by making us new, but we're believing and knowing that for our children and our children's children that you have the same. God, yes, they have free will and yes, they have choice. But our prayers make a difference. Our prayers change things. And God, we are believing that even if our children may not be serving you right now, that they will, God, because of our prayers. The prayers of the righteous God do not get unheard and they are not forgotten. Thank you for hearing my prayers and everyone's prayers in here for our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. God, we're thanking you in advance for what you're going to do. We're praising you, God, and we're thankful that you are a God that restores and heals and forgives because I know I haven't always been the perfect mother. I haven't always done maybe what you have had because I didn't know and I wasn't serving you, God. But I believe and I know that you have more. I've already watched you restore and heal what the locusts have eaten and taken away from maybe not the best decisions, God. And I thank you for it. Thank you for your forgiveness and for your life, for the changed life, God. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you for your blessings. The Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face toward you and give you peace sing that again the lord bless you Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Sing Amen.
worship him. Praise you, Jesus. favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children we're gonna sing it again come on may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 for you he is for you he is for you he is for you sing that bridge again but listen today listen this is the word of God we're singing is the word of God you can find it in numbers chapter number six and today as we sing this one more time I'm speaking that blessing over you it's your blessing it's not the blessing for people back then this is your blessing right now it's your blessing right here it's your blessing for today it's for your family for your children for their children it's your blessing in your coming and in your going. It's your blessing in your weeping and in your mourning. It's your blessing. And so I want you to receive that today as we sing that over you. You sing that over you and receive the blessing that God has. It's for right now. It's for right here. It's for today. Hallelujah. be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go with all you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your
your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. 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 Yes, Lord. Yes, God, we worship you this morning. You are so faithful, God. You're so faithful. God, you're good. You're good when it doesn't go our way. You're good when the prayer doesn't get answered the way we thought it should or we thought you would. God, you're good. Help us to always sing of the goodness of God. You're so worthy. You're so worthy, God. We bless your holy name. God, we thank you for the blessing that your word speaks over us. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. God. Now, Lord, we get ready to get into your word today and experience more of your goodness. Experience more of your blessing. Experience more for what you have for us, God. So prepare our heart right now. Your spirit doesn't leave when the song ends, God. Your Holy Spirit is right here. Change us. That when we leave today, we'd say we left different than when we showed up. For those that are in person, for those that are watching online, God, we just ask you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would meet them right where they are in their living room, in their kitchen, wherever they're watching, God, right now, in Jesus' name, pour out your blessing. Prepare our heart. Make it fertile soil for the word as it comes forth. We'll give you thanks, and we'll give you praise, and we'll do it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Give Jesus a clap offering. Hallelujah. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. 
before you're seated, or if you already are, just turn around, wave hi to someone. I'm going to wave hi to our online audience. We love you. We're so thankful that you're here, and you may be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. It is so great to worship with some folks in person again. It is good to see your smiling eyes. Some of your smiling faces, but it, it's just so good to be here and we thank you for being here and we thank you for those that are online and watching. We're thankful that you can be here. We want you to know that if you're online, you're part of the family. Uh, even though you might not be here in person, you are part of our family and we're thankful that you're here. Take out a Bible and turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. And while you're doing that, just a couple of quick announcements. We're going to still continue to connect throughout the week, uh, even though the doors are open now on Sundays. And so we'll have a Tuesday Devo that's posted on this Facebook page for those of you that are watching live, for those of you that aren't on our Life Spring Fellowship Facebook page. We're still going to do our Thursday Times of Encouragement at 7 o'clock. And so you can click that link and join us each Thursday evening at 7. We're going to continue to send out a weekly church email. And if you're not receiving, Receiving that, uh, touch base with Wendy today, or just drop us an email at info at lifespringlitits.com. We just want to take a brief moment and thank you, thank you, thank you for your faithfulness and giving over the last 12 weeks. This is 13 weeks now. This is week number 13 since we've been gathered together. It's hard to believe that, but it is true. And uh, we're just so thankful for God's faithfulness, but for your part in that and your faithfulness. So if you have been giving online, we're going to continue to, or we're going to ask you to continue to give online. Uh, you can do that through lifespringlitits.com. There's a give tab and you can do that. We're not taking up an offering here during the service in person, passing a plate, but there is a black box hanging up near the door as you're leaving. It says tithe and offering on it. So if you have something with you today, you can just drop that in the box and we would love to, uh, for you to do that. And if you're watching online, you can mail that to 490 West Lincoln Avenue, Lidditz, 17543. We are jumping into the scripture this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. And man, we're picking up towards the end of the second letter that Paul writes. But uh, I'm going to read the verses, kind of give you a little backstory to help you understand why Paul's writing it and the context. And then we'll jump into uh, what, what the message is for today. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm going to begin reading in verse number 3. Paul writes this, For though we live in the world... We do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Father, today... I'm asking your word to change me. I'm asking for your word to change those who are gathered in the church. And I'm asking for your word to change those who are watching online. We don't want to be the way we are. We want to be more like you. So Father, help us. Change us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Here is Paul's writing his second letter to the church. It's the second letter that we have. Uh, theologians tell us that this is probably the fourth letter that he wrote to the church in Corinth. But he's writing this. And in chapters number 10, 11, 12, and 13, Paul is going to defend his apostleship. He's going to defend his ministry because of the false accusations that are coming against him the false accusation that are coming against the authority, and, and even the miracles that God is performing through him. There are those group of people who believe Paul's ministry, they believe he is who he says he is, but there's this small group that rises up and comes against him in every fashion. And so Paul here in these chapters, 10, 11, 12, and 13, are basically going to defend himself. And if you take some time and read through those four chapters, Paul says some pretty straightforward, truthful things that 
they would ruffle anyone's feathers, step on our toes, and let's be honest, probably offend us if that was being said to us as individuals. But Paul is trying to help establish God's authority and what God desires in the life of believers. Paul recognizes the power that the church possesses. The power that the church possesses. Not the four walls, not the roof, not the comfy chairs you're sitting in, not your living room, not your dining room, and not the kitchen table. The power that you possess, because you're the church. You're the church. For though we live in the world, say in the world. In the world. Well, that, that was pretty good. That, that was pretty good. First service, uh, they needed a little help. But they got on board. You guys are on board. I appreciate it. If you're watching from the first service, sorry. We live in the world. You and I are called to live in the world. We're called to live in the world. Why? Because God's called us to tell others. God's called us to let the light of Christ shine, to be the salt and the light of the world. God's called us to do that. We can't do that if we're living in isolation. We can't do that if we only surround ourselves with other believers. We have to be in the world. That's where God desires for us to function. These times are good. We're getting built up. We're having fellowship. We're getting equipped. But we are not meant to live here. We are not meant to stay here. We are meant to be in the world. But even though we live in the world, he says in the second half of verse number three, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons, say the weapons, we fight with are not the weapons of the world. They are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, say contrary. This is fun now that you're here, because when I was doing this and nobody was here, I just hoped you were doing it. Now I can tell if you're really doing it. On the contrary, they are divine power. Say divine power. power. To demolish strongholds. And we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought. Say, captive every thought. And make it obedient to Christ. Our warfare, our main source of conflict in life, is not with other people. It's not with other people. It's against spiritual forces of evil. Put a bookmark, a pen, your neighbor's finger in your Bible here in 2 Corinthians 10 and turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter number 6. And we're going to go back and forth between 2 Corinthians 10 and Ephesians 6 throughout the message. So uh, whatever you have you to use mark now, in a moment you can mark Ephesians 6 as we go back to 2 Corinthians 10. Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse number 12 says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our conflict is not with each other. Our conflict is with the spiritual battles that are happening in the heavenly realm. If you and I could see into the heavenly realm right now, you would, you, you would be able to see that battle. That battle's taking place even here when we allow the enemy to have his place. We'll get into that in a couple of moments. But there, there's, there's battles all the time. Paul talks about it in Galatians 5, he talks about it here in Ephesians 6, he talks about it in 2 Corinthians 10. He talks about it in several of the letters that he writes to these different churches because, listen, this isn't just get saved, ask Christ to come into my life, and then I've crossed the finish line. No, there's a real enemy that exists. And you and I, I hope you, 
and I know that there is an enemy, and there is heaven, and there is hell, and God desires us because he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins so that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord would be saved. But the enemy is just as real, not trying to give him props, but state the reality that he is real and he wants you back so that you can rot in hell with him. So there's this battle that takes place. Going back to 2 Corinthians for a moment, take your bookmark out of 2 Corinthians 10, put it in Ephesians 5, because we'll be back. We live in the world, but we do not wage war as the world does. Well, what are the worldly weapons that people fight with? Thank you for asking. That's a very good question. Human intention, talent, wealth, organizational skills. Military might, eloquence, propaganda, charisma, personality. All of those things are human things. They're natural things that we use sometimes to fight spiritual battles. But when we use worldly things to war against spiritual things... We lose the battle every time because worldly things are inadequate to defeat the real enemy and to demolish Satan's strongholds. The only weapons that God provides are only the weapons that God provides are adequate adequate to resist evil, to crush Satan's resistance, to defeat ungodliness and combat false teaching. Only God provides the resources for those things to happen. Not your charming good looks, not your wonderful charisma and personality. Listen, those things in and of themselves aren't bad, but when we try to wage spiritual war with earthly resources, we lose. And the reality is there's so many believers that aren't living the word and the truth of God's word, and we're trying to fight with equipment that is just not going to get the job done. The weapons that God provides are powerful because they're spiritual and because they come from God. Paul lists some of these things back in Ephesians chapter 6, so let's go back real quickly. Ephesians chapter number 6. I'm going to back up one verse and start in verse 11, read verse 12 again, and then read a few of the verses that follow it. Ephesians 6, beginning in verse number 11, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is God's word, and pray in the spirit on all occasions. And with all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. In these weapons, God, equip me. Why would God equip you? Why would God allow us to tap into his heavenly resources? Because he loves you that much. By using the weapons against our spiritual enemies, the church 
individually, families, the body of Christ together comes, excuse me, will come through victorious through the battles and conflicts of life. As a result, God's presence, his power, and his purposes will work through his followers to save people spiritually, force demons out, purify, develop Christian character within us, baptize believers in the Holy Spirit, heal the sick. That's what God desires to do. Now listen, the scripture tells us the enemy is real. God is real. If you haven't read the last chapter, God wins in the end. And even in those moments where it feels like the enemy has the lead, God is victorious. And because of what he provides for you and I, you and I are victorious. Now, you would get the picture uh, through Ephesians 6 of this soldier that's equipped for battle. He's got his helmet and his sword, his shield, his breastplate, he's got his belt, he's got the, his feet fitted. He's, he's ready to go for battle and he stands there, ready for battle. It's a victorious position because he's been given everything that he needs. Now, Paul writes and tells us that there will be moments where fiery arrows will be shot at us. And we have the mechanisms, we have the spiritual tools to extinguish those flames. But the Roman soldier stands in victory. You and I, when we follow the truth of God's word in Ephesians 6, Galatians 5, 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, and all of the other ones that are listed, when you and I do it, we're standing in a position of victory. Why? Because God's won the battle through Jesus Christ. He paid for your healing. He paid for salvation. He paid for the bonds of sin to be broken. He paid for all of it. So you and I can stand victorious. When you stand in a position of defense all the time, you can't conquer. So we stand in victory. We march forward with the giftings, with the tools, with the spiritual forces that God gives us to be able to have victory. That's good news for the church, not for the building. The chairs don't care. That's good news for you and I. That's good news for people who are watching, for people who are in person. Everyone needs to hear it. That's why God calls you and I to be in the world so that we can tell others about the same thing that we know. And listen, these spiritual strongholds can be subtle and little or they can be huge and overtake us. Here's a subtle small one, and I'm just going to give one example. There, there's too, too many to give you all of them, but here's a subtle one if we're not careful. We've just come through, what, 12 weeks of quarantine. We've been asked to stay at home and restrict what we're doing in the business. You, you know all of it. You just lived it. And, and so we've been asked to do all of this, and now we're kind of re-emerging. I've gotten to know eight other people in this world even better than I already knew them. I mean, I already knew them pretty well, but I got to know them even better because we've been together for so long, doing everything. And it's been a huge blessing for our family. We can get into that in another message. But uh, when we go out, go do things beyond just the necessities. And if we're not careful, we hear this little voice saying, you don't need to associate with other people. You're just fine by yourself. You don't need interaction. You don't need fellowship. You don't need... This and that and this. You, you don't need those things. You're just fine all by yourself. That's a spiritual stronghold. God's not created us to be people that are just by ourselves. We need the connection with him first and foremost. We need this kind of connection too. That we can have fellowship with other people. That we can build each other up, pray for, we need that. God's created us that way. That's just a little example, but there are many, many, many. But can I tell you that you and I have to allow those things to come into our life. They don't have permission on their own to break through the armor. 
It's easy to get wrapped up in news coverage. It's easy to watch the television and see what's happening in the world around us and want to crawl under the chair and not come out. That's easy to do. You allow what comes into the temple of God. You allow the thoughts. Now listen, temp- be, remember, being tempted is not a sin. Jesus was tempted and sinned not. What we do with that temptation, what we do with that thought, what we do with what the enemy is trying to you know, mess us up, just what we do with that is where we fall short. That thing that we allow to catch our eye on television or while we're surfing the internet or those things, when we allow them, they have permeated the armor, but not because God's armor was insufficient, because we allowed it. We allowed those strongholds. We allowed uh, that thought. We allowed that temptation. We've set ourselves up. When we youth pastored, we would always tell our teenagers, don't set yourself up to fail. What does that mean? Don't go out on a date with just two people. Take some friends. Don't set yourself up to fail. And listen, it doesn't matter whether it's that one or, or a different policy, but have safeguards in your life. If, if there's an area that's a temptation, put some things in place so that your armor is set and secure. How do we fight our battles? We fight our battles through prayer. It's right there in, in, in Ephesians chapter number six, verse 18, and pray in the spirit. Now listen, if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's not permission to not pray. Seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Seek more of God. But you and I ought to pray. How else do we fight that battle? We fight it through our worship. We're fighting some battles this morning. We're worshiping this morning. I think the Lord was pleased with that worship today. Not because your every note that came out of your mouth was right on pitch and it was right. No, because we're singing from the treasures in our heart for the love and adoration that we have for God. He said, make a joyful noise. He said, nothing about being in tune. But I believe that was a sweet and and fragrant offering that we were able to give to the Lord. That's how we do our battle. And then we stand in our victorious position, ready to do whatever needs to be done. Listen, if we, we have to allow the truth of God's word to come into our heart, to let it meditate and let it find a place that it can rest. Here's what I mean by that. If, if, if Bill and I get into a little bit of an argument, what does the scripture teach me? I'm not upset with Bill. There's a spiritual battle. And the enemy's just trying to work me, uh, him to me and, and through me to him. He's trying to create this wedge. He's trying to create. The, but it's really not Bill that I'm upset with. I mean, when my wife and I have a disagreement, it's really not her that I'm upset with. There's a spiritual battle. When it's your coworker, when it's your neighbor, when it's your kid, adult or small, when, it's, when it is a, a problem, it's not a person. The battle is a spiritual battle. And the sooner we recognize that, the quicker we can be armed and ready. The quicker we can pray. The quicker we can love. The quicker we can take it to God and worship. The quicker that we can get the truth of God's word and we can put on that armor. That, that when we begin to have our eyes open, I need the truth of God's word. It's easy to say, oh, that's stinking Bill. You know, whatever, and and I can't believe, and that's easy. But that's the earthly battle. That's not the source. That's not the root. It's a spiritual problem. And the sooner that I recognize that, the sooner I fight that battle the correct way. And the sooner that battle gets fought the correct way, then the sooner we get unified and back to doing the thing that God desires us to do. What does God desire us to do? Love each other. Love each other. Now, I'm sure this has never happened to any of you, but there has been known to happen to other people that we have a tough time loving people. I was just in a situation the other day, and I said something that I shouldn't have said. 
Can I be real for a moment? Somebody made a comment. Having a conversation and a comment was made, I don't like them. And so what did I re- say in, in rebuttal to that? Or what did I say right after that? Well, I don't like them either. I should have never said that. That was emotion. That was in my mind. That's not the truth of God's word. But conviction came upon me. God being faithful, disciplining those that he loves. How can you say that you love me if you hate your brother? When I recognize God's love for me, and I recognize God's love for humanity, for people, all people, then I don't act out of emotion. I don't speak out of turn. I don't, those things don't happen. But in that moment, I spoke and tried to fight a spiritual battle with earthly resources. And I'm sure you're not guilty of that at all. But can I encourage you today? Only the effective spiritual weapons of truth, faith, and the power of the Holy Spirit can destroy sin's power in my life and in your life and rescue people from Satan's schemes. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10, we do not live in the world, excuse me, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they, the weapons that God uh, has empowered us with, have divine power to not just remove strongholds, but demolish strongholds. That's the divine power that you and I have been given when we fight the battle with the spiritual weapons that we've been given and not with our own weapons. Divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments, every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Taking captive every thought and making it obedient to Christ. That's a full-time job right there. For some of us, that's a full-time job. Taking every captive thought and lining it up with God's word. When the enemy tries to speak and says, you're not good enough, take that thought and say, God, what does your word say? Your word, nowhere in your word does it say I'm not good enough. So guess what? I'm not going to believe that thought. That, that's what that's saying to us. We have to take every thought captive and line it up to the word of God. We just sang the, the blessing. Anything that contradicts that is not of God. So take the captive thought, take that thought captive and line it up to scripture. And if it doesn't match, throw it away. Get rid of it. Don't believe it. This is the truth of God's word, and we have got to let it permeate into our inner being so that, one, we can recognize the love that God has for each one of us. Because, if listen, if I don't recognize the love that God has for me, I have a tough time loving you. And you, and you, and you. But when I recognize the love that God has for me, and I recognize I don't deserve it, I didn't do anything to earn it, But he loves me anyway. And then it becomes easier to love you. But can I take that one step further? Not only does it become easier to love you, I begin to get a burden for those who don't know Jesus. Because if I recognize that God loves me, even though I don't deserve it, I didn't earn it, I didn't do anything to, you know, merit that. And I recognize you as fellow believers of Jesus Christ, God loves you that same way. 
And God's not partial. God loves everyone the same. He's not, there aren't any that are elevated in his eyes. We're all on level playing field. If you're human, God loves you. Then I get a burden for those that don't know Jesus. Because they need to experience the same love that I've experienced. They need to know these spiritual weapons that exist that they can tap into. They need to know about prayer, and they need to know about worship, and they need to know about uh, grace and mercy and forgiveness. They need to know about healing and restoration. They need to know about bondages being broke. They need to know about marriages being restored. They need to know about addictions being broken. They need to know that. And as I love God more, I recognize the love that He has for me. I love you more, and I love people who don't know Him, and that should should cause us to do something. So right now, let's stand up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's time for the church to be the church. I read this quote earlier this week, and I want to read it to you as we begin our altar time. The church that fails to use the spiritual weapons available through Christ will be overcome by the spiritual powers of darkness. And its families will be battered and taken captive by worldly forces of evil. I want to read that one more time. The church that fails to use the spiritual weapons available through Christ will be overcome by the spiritual powers of darkness and its families will be battered and taken captive by worldly forces of evil. My daughter, Hannah, took a pretty bad, had a pretty bad wreck with her bike this week. Left a good part of her knee. I mean, it, it was really big, uh, really big. And she, pretty, pretty bad. I don't need to give you all the details. She's okay. We only had the little band-aids at home, you know, that cover most of the boo-boos. We didn't have any of the big ones. We could have put a couple little band-aids over that, that would have hurt. That wouldn't have fixed anything. That probably would have ripped off more skin, caused more pain, and really in the end, she'd have been worse off. Sometimes as believers, we're guilty of using earthly things to put band-aid on spiritual things. Evil forces are swirling. There's some, some spiritual battles taking place, and we might respond with words, thinking that's going to fix things. That's putting a little Band-Aid on a big problem. We might think we've got the intellect, or we might have the charm, or the charisma, or the dashing good looks to fix something or, 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 or mend something that's broken. But when in reality, when in reality those things will not work at all. God desires, church, for you and I to use the spiritual weapons that He has given us. Prayer, worship, the helmet, the breastplate, all of the things that He calls us to equip us with or calls us to equip ourselves with and stand in victory because the price has been paid. The battle's been won. Christ hung on the cross and then resurrected again. And then gives that same power to us to be able to do what His Word says we can do. So it's time to stop using little band-aids. And it's time to use the resources that God has given us. Would you close your eyes? Would you bow your head this morning as we just spend a few moments? We're not calling people to the altar this morning. The altar is right where you are. The altar is in your living room. The altar is at the kitchen table. The altar is in your seat if you're in person. 
because the Holy Spirit is everywhere. Holy Spirit, right now, invade our space. Oh, you've already done it, but we're asking you to continue to do it. You've spoken through your word. We don't have to ask for these resources. We don't have to ask for these weapons. We don't have to ask for the shield or the... God, you've already given it to us. You've already given it to us. You've made them available. So, Father, help us to operate in your word and fight the battle with the spiritual weapons that you've already given us. To be faithful to pray, to worship. Because you said, Lord, when we do it that way, that we would bring down those spiritual forces of evil. You said that in your word, God. And your word is true, and it's amen. And you allow that to happen because you're good, God. Because you're faithful. And so, Lord, right now, Every person watching online, every person that's gathered in person, right now, Father, would you just flood us with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Lord, with your love, maybe there's some right now that you're showing. There was a time earlier this week, earlier today, or last week, Lord, where we fought with an earthly weapon. We responded out of emotion. We responded with something that we shouldn't have. Father, can we confess that right now if that's you confess that right now just ask God to forgive you and he's faithful and just and he will forgive you and then father would you go one step further and would you help us to recognize what you've already done for us what you've already given us Oh God, we worship you. You're worthy of our praise. Move, Father, right now. Father, right now, we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Father, your word says that we have divine power to demolish strongholds, to demolish arguments and pretensions that set themselves up against the knowledge of who you are. And then, Father, you tell us to pray, to pray, to be men and women and boys and girls of prayer. God, forgive us for those moments when it might feel like nothing happens when we pray. God, that is a stronghold of the enemy to keep us from praying. But help us to know that there's victory and there's power. Because that's what your word says. Even if we don't sense it, even if we don't feel it, it is there because you said it's there. Now, Father, as we prepare to leave this place today, help us to be the church, to be the salt and the light, equipped with the spiritual armor, equipped with prayer and worship, to stand in victory. on church right now I want you to begin to pray as we get ready to conclude I want you to begin to pray because listen as we begin to submerse ourselves in God the enemy's trying to whisper the enemy's trying to tell you something right now take that thought captive 
and speak against it. It has no place in your mind. It has no place in your life. Take it captive. Line it up with the Word of God. And if it doesn't fit, get rid of it in Jesus' name. Come on, right now. Take a moment. Lord, we line our thoughts up with you. Enemy, you are not welcome. You have no lodging place in our hearts. You have no lodging place in our mind. You have no lodging place in our family. You have no lodging place. You are not welcome here, enemy. Thank you and we praise you. We give you praise and glory and honor today. And God, what you're doing right now doesn't stop when we say amen. It doesn't stop when we get back in our car or scroll to the next thing on Facebook. It doesn't stop in in the next 30 seconds. God, you continue. You're going to continue. And I pray, God, that we would be sensitive to that. We wouldn't go back to the same thing. We wouldn't go back to believing lies. We wouldn't go back to hating people. We wouldn't go back to, but Lord, you've put us in a new direction, facing a new way. So God, help that to stay, to stick in our hearts, to stick in our minds, in, in our very, uh, in our spirit, in our very being, God. Not to go back the way we were, but Lord, to be drawn closer into your presence and who you want us to be. God, we thank you and we praise you that you always have more. Draw us. Now, Father, we'll thank you, and we'll praise you, and we'll give you the praise and the honor and the glory that you are so worthy of. And we do it all in the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. Give the Lord a clap offering. Give the Lord a clap offering.